Well, we are 14, I counted today. So we're gradually 15. I didn't see Mike come in over there. So 15 today. So thank you for all for being here and hopefully we'll continue to, to grow as things open up a little bit. Hopefully everybody who's on Facebook uh, got my note that we are on session two today. Uh, we're kind of behind, so don't pay attention with the um, dates because we're two behind and then we jumped ahead and did the Easter Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. So now we're going back and picking up the ones we left. So it's two this week, three next week, and six the next week. And I will try to remind you as to where you are. But this week is two, next week is three, and then the next week is six. And then we'll continue on in order. So today we're in Luke chapter 15, and it's the parable of the prodigal son. So let's kind of take a minute and look at um, what's happened up until this point in Jesus' travels from Galilee to Jerusalem. And the first, I guess it would have been the winter semester, the winter quarter, uh, we looked at the first nine chapters of the book of Luke, which is Jesus' birth in his early life and his Galilean ministry. And then beginning with the spring quarter, we started with chapter 10, and we're going to move through the rest of the book of Luke, and we're going to look at the uh, Judean ministry, and then we we'll end up with Passion Week, which we actually did the last couple of weeks, uh, and then the rest of the, the book of Luke. Uh, the section that we're looking at in this week's lesson is, I think, actually chapters 13 through 15 is the context chapter. We're only looking at a portion of that. But again, it's kind of important to tell you what's happened before we get to the parable of the prodigal son. So in chapter 13, Jesus has a number of teachings that deal with the kingdom of God. And one important thing that comes out of chapter uh, Luke 13 is Jesus talks about how the first will be last and the last will be first. That's always kind of confused me a little bit is exactly what he meant. Who was the first? Who was the last? And the commentary in the teacher's book had a very interesting observation, which I'd never thought of it this way before. But the way the writer of the commentary explained it, the first were the Jews. They were the first ones to be chosen as God's people. And what Jesus is saying to his listeners, according to the guy who wrote the commentary, is that those who were first given the opportunity to be God's people, the Jews, many of them will not accept what he says and would therefore not enter the kingdom of God. But the ones who were last, in other words, everybody but the Jews, would enter because they would listen and accept him as the Messiah. I have never heard it explained that way before, but it kind of makes sense to me. Hopefully it makes sense to you that way too. If not, you're prerogative. Luke 14 is again Jesus confronting the Pharisees and talking about again who is going to go into the kingdom of heaven and how the Jews, his parables basically give the idea that the Jews are going to reject him because he's not what they were expecting. And it's the marriage feast where people give excuses for not coming. Probably remember those parables, but that's the, the gist of the chapter 15. And then, excuse me, 14. And then chapter 15, where we are today, is the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, which is what we're gonna talk about today. So as we get started, how many people like to attend reunions? Show of hands. How many people like to attend reunions? Kind of depends on the reunion. Okay. Um, as a child, we used to have family reunions. I don't know if people do it like we used to or not, but 
my uh, parents and I, we lived up close to a, a town. We were in what would then be considered suburbia, kind of not like what you see around here with the, I hate to call them cookie cutter, but all the houses looking the same. Our houses look differently. But we lived in a, our closer knit community. Most of our relatives lived in a more rural area. So once a year or so, there was a reunion on my father's side. There was a reunion on my dad, uh, mother's side. And we would most of the time go down to the farm, one of the farms of my aunts or uncles. And we'd set up benches outside under the tree. And all of us young'uns would go out and we would play with cousins that we got to see about twice a year. And the adults had a chance to talk and more food than you could ever eat. And we would just have a good old time playing and talking and having a ball. Uh, recently, in the last four or five years, my brother and sister, as we've gotten older, we've decided we wanted to do something similar. So the last probably six years, every couple of years, we have gotten together somewhere for a family reunion my family, my brother's family, my sister's family. Ours is more of a, we don't bring food, we go to a resort or something and just hang out and have a chance to catch up. But, you know, we enjoy being together a couple of times a year. <laughs> Not sure I want to be together all the time. <laughs> um, those I like. High school, college reunions, not so much. I went to my 40th high school reunion and I really didn't have a whole heck of a lot in common with those folks anymore. <clears throat> I had left where I grew up, I'd been career in the military all over the world, been in other places, done other things, and most of them had stayed home, and we didn't have a whole lot in common to talk about. Likewise with the one college reunion that I went to, didn't really have a lot in common. Haven't been back. Just really did not feel worthwhile to me to go back and, and see because... It's a bunch of old people. <laughs> bunch of old people that can't get around. <laughs> so, I like the family reunions. I don't like the others. I don't know about you. So we're going to look at, a, in a way, a reunion today. But it's a reunion, a family reunion, and the, the way people responded to it. So like I say, it's the parable of the uh, prodigal son. And the parable in the lesson starts at the end, if you will, of the story. That makes the wrong place to start. So we're going to start at the beginning, and we're going to read through a little bit of it. I'm going to read out of the Holman version of the Bible. And I'm going to read the first eight or nine verses, which kind of sets the stage of where we're going to be today. Our session actually starts with Luke 15, uh, verse 20. I'm going to actually go back and read 11 through 19, which is the setup for the day's story. But it's a couple of things in there that are kind of important for us to get the context before we look at what happens in the actual lesson for the day. Context is real important. Again, um, some of the commentaries that I have read when the people write about what's going on and, and what they think these uh, parables mean, they always make a point that context is important. Because for many of us, we look at these stories and we look at them with 21st century eyes. We look at them in the context of our culture, our time, and we really need to look at them in the culture of the time in which they were written and to the people that they were written. So let's take a look at Luke 15, 11 through 19, and I just want to make a few comments as we go through, and then we'll pick up with today's lesson. So chapter 15, verse 11 in the Holman. He also said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate have coming to me, so he distributed the assets to them. Okay, a couple of things to be aware of here in the context of who Jesus is speaking to. Inheritance in this time and age, the oldest son would normally have gotten, there were two sons, the oldest son would have normally gotten two-thirds of the inheritance, 
and the younger son would have gotten one-third of the inheritance. It was the normal way of dividing up an inheritance. But what I think is significant here for us to, make, to mention is that you didn't get an inheritance until when? When he died. So basically, this younger son is saying to his father, my interpretation, okay, you're worth more to be dead than alive. Give me what I get when you die. I want it now. I can't wait for you to die. Well, apparently it was done. It was, well, he, his father did it. Yeah. But... Seems kind of arrogant to me. Yeah. Demanding. Mm -hmm. Selfish. Selfish. I mean, the father graciously said he'd do it, but it doesn't sound like the son had a very good opinion of his father. Well, we know he wasn't very smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he wasn't very smart. Yeah. Uh, verse 13. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he has been everything, a severe phantom struck the land and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who had sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the carbopods of the pigs were eating, but no one would give him any. Remember, pigs are unclean to Jews. Pigs are about the absolute most unclean animal the Jews would know. So here is a Jewish young man who once was evidently fairly wealthy, who had spent all his money in riotous living, and now he is having to deal with unclean animals as the only way to make a living. And evidently he's not making a good enough living that he can, even can afford to buy food. He's willing to eat the slop that the pigs are given. 17. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food, and here I am dying of hunger? I'll get up, go to my father, and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired hands. He finally realized how far he had fallen from the son of evidently a fairly wealthy landowner he had fallen to feeding slop to unclean pigs and he finally if you will woke up to his situation and said you know the hired hands of my father are better off than I am I'm going to go back and ask him to make me a hired hand and that's where we pick up the story today so, Luke 15, 20 through 24. Oh, Francis. King James, right? Would you read 20 to 24? And he arose and came to his father. And when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. So when the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Okay. Verse 20 starts off with the word so. In scriptures, and I guess really just in context of the way we write today, usually when you say so something, it means something went before it. It's like but being a contrast. Here so is, okay, all of that's gone before has brought me to this point. So because I realized I have fallen, I am no longer uh, living the life I could be living, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make a change. He got up and went to his father. Now, 
the commentary says you can interpret he got up in a couple of ways. Uh, one, he got up physically and went to his father. He also got up spiritually because notice what he's going to say to his father. I'm going to send, I send in your sight and in God's sight. So he realizes that he has, if you will, backslidden in regards to his father, and he's backslidden in response to God. So I'm going to get up and I'm going to try to redeem myself. <clears throat> But while the son was a long way off, to me that means the father's been looking for him. If he sees him a long way off, it's not like the son came up and knocked on his door. The father was looking for him to come home. His father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. Okay, what did guys back there then wear clothes? robes okay and they were not short robes they went down pictures I've seen I'm assuming the pictures that we see are legitimate they come down to about the ankles right mm -hmm. I've never tried to run in a robe however <laughs> ladies if you had a long dress would you succeed in running in them sure if you had yeah. to, you had to? <laughs> You, you pull, pull them up, up right? Yeah. This guy's a wealthy landowner. Can you imagine the servants seeing their boss hike his robes up and take off running down the street? Yeah, what happened to him? Yeah, what happened? Best undignified way you've ever done this, boss. What in the world is going on? Not only that, he went up and threw his arms around this. Looked like a vagrant, I would think, for the the workers because you know he's coming home after working with pigs he probably smells dirty evidently had no shoes but father hikes his robes up runs down the street he saw him afar off so it wasn't like it was just from you know from here to Dean back there he took off at a, a distance threw his arms around him and then the tense of the verb where it talks about and kissed him doesn't mean he gave him one kiss means he kissed him over and over and over again. He was so overjoyed to see his son, he just couldn't contain himself. Not only would it have been undignified, it would have been totally out of character for most men of that period, and honestly probably of any period, if you want to be honest. I'm talking for me now. I don't know about the rest of you guys. But you probably don't go run and throw your arms around another guy, son or otherwise, and kiss him and kiss him and kiss him. But that's what this guy did. He was so overjoyed to see his son come home that he just could not restrain the joy. So, verse 21. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Say, so look back up to verse 18 and 19, and what's missing from the son's declaration. What did the son in his mind prepare to say to his father and what did he actually get out? Well, he didn't get out the part about please take me on as a hired servant. Yeah. Right, evidently. He didn't get to the part I want to be a hired servant. The father did not try to excuse his behavior. He did get out the point, you know, verse 21, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I recognize that my sin is not only against you, it's also against God. And I'm not worthy to be called your son. Now, you can interpret that as the man's son or God's son, you know, part of God's family. But he didn't get to the point of saying, just make me a hired servant. Instead, the father interrupts him and starts off verse 22 quick don't lallygag around folks go do this right now bring out the best robe put it on his 
put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Like I said a minute ago, this guy's been feeding pigs. He probably smells. He's probably ragged. And the father is commanding the servants to put the best robe on him, clean him up, give him a, a ring. The ring probably has something to do with the family. So think of a, a ring that has the, like the family emblem or something on it that signifies you're now part of the family again. Put uh, sandals on, your, on his feet. Let's restore him to his position of son. And then he goes on and says, 23, bring the fatted calf and slaughter it and let's celebrate with a feast. Well, we have traveled a number of different places being in the military and <coughs> otherwise for that matter. But in many places, particularly outside of Western civilization, Western cultures, meat is a rarity. Uh, most of you know we spent three years in Kenya. In Kenya, you don't eat meat very often. Meat is for celebrations only. In this culture, same thing. Meat is not something that was eaten a lot. I don't think in Middle Eastern culture it's eaten a lot today. But they always kept a very special animal, meat, fattened and prepared, so when there was a reason for a big celebration, you had meat. In this case, it was a fatted calf. And the father says, okay, it's time to break out, my words, the good stuff. Let's bring the meat out because this is a, an occasion worth celebrating. Because this son of mine was dead and is alive again, he was lost in his family. So they began to celebrate. The celebration wasn't just the father being happy that the son was back. He wanted the entire community to celebrate. Everybody needed to be involved in this celebration. It wasn't just that I'm happy, we all need to be happy, my son is back. Okay, verses 25 through 30. Susan, what's your version? Um, and I think, good. 15, uh, 25 to 30, please. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he had him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son, this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home and you kill Okay. Again, look at verse 25. It starts with now. Again, like the so a few minutes ago, the now <laughs> means think back to what's just happened, and now here's the next event that's going to happen. This happens because of that. The older son was out in the field. Well, again, this is a wealthy landowner probably has lots of servants and at this point remember he split his inheritance so the younger son got his one-third and the older son got his two-thirds so basically everything that's left in the household and the estate belongs to who the older son the older son so he's out in the field supervising the hired hands doing the work and he's worked hard all day and he comes to the house and he hears music and dancing. So what's his first thought? What's going on? What's going on? <laughs> Did somebody come in and I wasn't aware of it? We're having a party. Why aren't we having a party? And again, context is important. When you look at the word, words in the Greek, when they talk about music and dancing, they're not talking about just hearing 
I don't think they had them then, but let's just say they, they're not thinking about hearing guitars playing. The music here means we have an orchestra going here, folks. We got drums, we got harps, we got we got a real jam session going. And when it talks about dancing, they're talking again about a group of people. There is a wedding going on. We have a party happening here. And why? Why wasn't I invited? Or why didn't I know about it? So what does he do? Verse 20. So, again, I don't know what's going on. I'm curious. So he summoned one of the servants and asked what these things meant. So he didn't go in and stick his head in the door and say, okay, guys, what's going on? He called one of the servants out. He wanted to know what was happening before he went in. The servant says, your brother is here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered, slaughtered the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The servant is expecting what? The brother to be happy. The brother to be happy. I mean, the father's happy. They're having a big party. This son that was lost is now home. <clears throat> he expected the older brother to be happy about the whole thing. Instead, verse 28, he became angry and didn't want to go in. Never thought of it this way, but again, one of the commentaries say, Think of this as, it's just not I'm angry. Think of the guy having a temper tantrum stomping around out in the garden outside the house. I mean, he is fit to be tied. There's a party going on for my brother, who as far as I'm concerned should be condemned, not celebrated. And yet we're having a party for him. So the father came out and pleaded with him. Evidently, the servant went back in and said, Hey, boss, your older son's out here, and he's throwing a temper tantrum because we're having a party for your younger son. So what does the father do? 29. Uh, so the father came out and pleaded with him, but he replied to his father, I want you to notice what the older son is interested in. Verse 29. Look, I have been slaving many years for you, and I have never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fatted calf for him. Who's the older son interested in? Him. Notice everything is, I did this, I did this, I did this. Nothing about the father, nothing about his younger brother. It's, I've been working for you all these years. I have never disobeyed your commands. Jesus is talking to a crowd with a lot of Pharisees in there. And you got to remember, what do the Pharisees hang their hats on as far as their relationship with God. The law. So, the Pharisees are very legalistic. To them, the fact that they're going to heaven is because of they're keeping the law. Not because of God's grace. It's because we're your chosen people. We have done what you have told us to do. Not true, by the way, but that's their claim. The son says, you've never even given me a young goat so I can have a party. Can you say pity party? <laughs> what else would you call it? The older son's having a pity party. But Jesus is being very pointed here, I think, to the Pharisees. That, and they, I think, will recognize it. This is you, guys. This is how you look at your relationship to the Father. And then in verse 30, when this son of yours doesn't even acknowledge that it's his brother. It's, Dad, it's this son of yours. Not my brother. It's this son of yours came home. Instead of condemning him, instead of Punishing him? 
You throw a party for him. How wrong is that? Again, Pharisees. We're children of Abraham. We are God's chosen people. Everybody else needs to be condemned. They're all the ones who are sinners, not us. Yet you're celebrating when they come to you. How does the Father respond? 31, 32. Ben of yours is New International again, isn't it? Mm -hmm. 31 and 32. My son, the Father said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Okay. He starts off by saying, you're still my son. The Jews are still God's chosen people. That relationship hasn't changed. But the family relationship is bigger than just us and God. You're always with me. You have been with me from the beginning. I chose you back with Abraham. You have been with me since the beginning. Everything I have is yours. Divided the estate. One third went to the younger brother. Two thirds went to him. Everything that's left is yours. But, again, the contrast here between the son's attitude, the older son's attitude, and the father's attitude, between God's attitude and the Pharisee's attitude. But we have to celebrate because one who was lost, one who was outside of God's family has come home. We need to celebrate. He was dead and is now alive. He was lost and is found. And by the way, he's a brother of yours. He doesn't say my son. He says your brother has come home. What happens? Well, they make you worried or think about it just a little bit. Okay, so the man that stayed home, everything's supposed to be his. Well, what's this brother going to get now that everybody's happy that he's coming back and they're going to celebrate? Now, he's going to get some of the brother's money. There's just no way around it. Where else is he going to get money? <laughs> He's living with his father while the father's alive. I got him. Yeah, well, that, that, that money's the other son's, though. That's what the other son's thinking. You're going to get some of what I have left. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, he's already getting the fatted calf. He's already getting the fat. Yeah. Which, by the way, would have brother. technically belonged to the yeah. older brother. Yeah. Brother. Well, well, what, 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 well, he ought to be mad as can be. Yeah. I thought I to I wonder, well... How is he going to survive? And he can only stay there so long, I guess, till dad would pass away, maybe, and then his brother would. I mean, how do, how do they earn money? I, I don't mean, know. Or, uh, While the father is still alive and I guess technically has control of the estate, the younger son is fine. But again, th this is not a story that we're going to try to make exactly fit God and humanity. I just didn't know what happened back in those days. I don't know. Well, how many fatted but, calves did they have? I would think they would fatten one. At the used one, they would fatten another one. It takes a long time. It takes a while. And when the father died, would everything be split again? No. Technically, I, my reading would be no. It still belongs to the other. I don't know. The other brother. But the question is, what does the older brother do? Jumps off mad. Yeah, he's yeah. angry. He's angry, but does it give you a resolution? Does the younger brother, older brother go in and accept his younger brother? Does the younger older brother stay mad and stay outside and throw it's a temper unknown. tantrum? We have to look for the rest of the story. Yeah, the Paul Harvey's rest of the story? There's no rest of the story. We don't know. I think we are still living that story. If I rejoice when a sinner repents and comes to the church that I don't think it's worthy, well, then I'm the older brother. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I don't rejoice. But it's how I treat people that do repent and come to the Lord. That is the rest of the story. Yeah. Thank you, to John. That, that's really the point of the lesson today. <laughs> you know, he, he's pointing to the Pharisees who, for them, everybody that's not one of us 
needs to be condemned by God. Unless you become a proselyte and convert to Judaism and follow the Jewish law, you are condemned, you are a sinner, you are the worst of the worst. If they accepted Jesus' message, they still weren't happy because they didn't accept his message. But it, as John just said, it applies today to us. If we have a person who doesn't meet our standards that comes to the church and accepts Christ, should we not rejoice with them? Yeah. After all, remember, we were all once outside of God's kingdom too. We were all once prodigals as well until we became Christians, became part of his kingdom. We were all dead before we accepted life through Jesus. Isaiah says we were all sheep straying around until we followed the shepherd. You know, we have all been the prodigal. Maybe we didn't squander our living. I had a friend once, missionary to Belgium, said that heaven will be filled with the meanest, nastiest people in the world, and hell will be filled with good and righteous people. And his purpose, his message behind that statement was that the good and righteous don't realize they need a Savior. The Pharisees thought they were going to get into heaven because of their works. They don't need a Savior. We are going to make it on our own. But the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the Gentiles realized they needed a Savior. They're the ones who are going to make it into heaven. Now, that doesn't mean that we should not witness to the well-to-do and only witness to the down and out, but we should be happy when the down and out come in. Okay, enough preaching on my part. Uh, any comments on the, any got that footnotes or comments of something that I didn't say or that struck you? I covered this and it says, because the father said that everything he had was the older son's name. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, the other one. And it said, this parable could have been entitled the father's love instead of the prodigal son. Uh, because it was uh, centered on the exclusiveness of the Pharisees who failed to understand God's love. Okay. And the concern and joy of God and the repentance of sinners. And that's what it's all about. That, that's, that's what it's, yeah. I think that's what John said. Yeah. Basically. In a modern day setting. Right. That's all I It's know. been two or three years ago. We did a study here one time at the church on a book called The Prodigal God, which was looking at this parable from the standpoint of God. And God bringing prodigals to himself we were all once prodigals anybody else with a comment or something that struck them okay thank you all for coming and um, Bert can I ask you to close us in prayer sure Lord we are gathered here and we are so thankful for the ability to be here and thankful for the lesson that shows us your love. We ask that you continue to be with us as we leave this place and grant us all good health this week.